Hello and welcome to today's session, Get the F Out of Here, Challenging the Oppressive Status Quo by Equitizing Our Grading Practices. I hope you are prepared for an amazing session that will really get you thinking and rethinking a lot of what you're probably doing in your class, a lot of what you have always done in your classes, and a lot of the way you have always learned in classes in your past. We are joined here today by three speakers. First, I want to say hi to you all. My name is Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I am faculty mentor for online teaching and learning with the California Community Colleges, CVC, and At One. And we have three fantastic presenters here today, all who are faculty members in the California Community College system. They wear many hats, and they'll probably tell you more about what they do. Um, but just to introduce them to you, we are joined here today by Dr. Bree Brown from Cuyamaca College. And Bree is an assistant professor of English distance and distance education coordinator. And we've shared each of our presenters Twitter handles on the screen too, in case you want to connect directly with them and learn with them and let them know how you're feeling about the session today. We're also joined by Dave Dillon from Grossmont College and Dave is an, the online education coordinator and a professor of counseling at Grossmont. And Fabiola Torres is here with us today. Hi, Fabi. Fabiola is from Glendale College. She also wears many hats. One of them is Professor of Ethnic Studies and Fabiola's email signature line actually says humanized instructor of ethnic studies, which I love every time I see that it makes me smile. Um, so I'm going to click here and we'd like to get started by acknowledging that this virtual session here today is taking place throughout the unceded territory of California, which is home to nearly 200 tribal nations. As we begin, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. And I'm going to turn things over to Dave at this point. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Thanks very much for that warm introduction. The three of us are honored to present on this topic and we appreciate the opportunity. I'm Dave. Welcome. Uh, wherever you may be physically, we welcome you. Wherever you may be mentally, we welcome you. We note there, there have been and there continue to be many challenges. We also note creative solutions. We have admiration and appreciation for courage, for innovation, optimism, enthusiasm, and all of the equity-based work you are doing. We are thankful to have you here with us today. And we're gonna get started with a word cloud. Um, Michelle, did I click a wrong button or? Mm, I don't see screen sharing in progress anymore, but I'll get that word link. Cloud. Folks, I'm gonna um, put a link in the chat for you. You'll see a question says, what do grades measure and a link? And we would like you to click on that link. It'll open a new window on your screen and go ahead and answer that prompt. What do grades measure? You can enter a word, you can enter a short phrase. There is no judgment, no criticism. We're just interested in what you think. You will not be graded on your answers. 
And I see folks putting your responses in the chat, which is absolutely fine. If you'd like to have your, your responses be included with everyone else's in the word cloud, you'll wanna click on the link that I put in the chat under this, the question, what do grades measure? And I'll put that in the chat one more time. Okay, that link will stay open if you want to continue to add to it, but we are going to now move forward and we've got one more activity. So when you're when you're done with with your um, entering the response to that question, come back to zoom and rejoin us and we're going to launch a poll. Are you ready for that Dave. Yeah, thank you for your participation in the word cloud. We will be sharing the result from that later in the presentation. And we have one more poll to get us started. And we really just want to pull the group regarding the use of ungrading. And, and in this instance, I'm going to loosely define ungrading as both a reference to a large umbrella of many aspects of non traditional grading and also a specific type of non-traditional grading. For the purpose of this poll, we're interested in knowing, have you tried any type of ungrading, which might be ungrading itself, it might be contract grading, it might be any other um, non-zero grading or any non-traditional grading approach. And it is okay, you, you may be doing some non-traditional grading and, and not know. So we, we put an I'm not sure option in there as well. The responses are flying in. We've already got 70% of participants who have responded. We've got just under 300 people here today, which is super exciting. Okay, and it looks like uh, the responses are really slowed down. So we'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna end the poll and we'll share those results out so everybody can see them. Wow. Uh, so I, I honestly had not much of a idea of what to expect. And this is a wonderful um, pulse to see that more than half um, who responded have some experience in doing this. So um, that's fantastic. That, that shows progression and, and we're excited. And for the no group, um, hopefully you may hear something today that um, allows you for a potential opportunity to try it. And if you're not sure, maybe some of you are already doing it um, and we're excited to, to present to all audiences. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for everybody for participating. Okay, this is um, this is our best effort at um, walking you through what and how we're going to share. And so, um, I encourage you just to to listen and pay attention to um, thinking about how we get from traditional grading to more equitable grading, and the how and the why, and um, and some of, of how we get there, uh, we are gonna talk more in detail about with seeing inequities and sharing power and shifting power and reshaping power and how that progression, um, how we have experienced that progression. Okay, um, good to start with the beginning. So uh, first a shout out to all the educators who have been doing this long before us. Some folks have been pioneering this for a long time. We appreciate you, we respect you, we've learned from you, we admire you. Thanks for your work and your energy. Uh, Bell Hooks, Alfie Cohn, Laura Gibbs, Jesse Stommel, Asao Inau, Susan Bloom are just a few 
um, of these pioneers. And, um, and I'd like to showcase um, quickly some of these voices. So I'm going to share uh, the trailer here for the ungrading book. In the book I wrote, I love learning, I hate school. Um, at the end, I said, if there was one thing I could change about teaching, it would be to get rid of grades. We think that grades are motivating. Well, no, there are other ways to motivate. There really is an inverse relationship between a learning-oriented classroom and a grade-oriented classroom. And I guess implicit in much of this and in many of the chapters of this book is the idea that we can do something about it. There's also something really valuable about having a book-length work with lots of different voices from lots of different places. I need this book to be written because I need to be able to hand it out. Okay. If, if you haven't read the Ungrading book, we recommend it. Uh, Ungrading is a book that was recommended to me by multiple colleagues in the summer of 2021, and I didn't want to read it because I needed a break. Uh, but I kept hearing about it, and more people recommended it and said I should read it. And when the eighth colleague recommended it, I ordered it. Uh, two pages into Alfie Cohn's forward, I was hooked. Uh, aspects of traditional grading that I, that had been in my subconscious uh, that I was never comfortable with were all of a sudden connected with the words from the authors. And I could feel the harm being done to students coming off the pages as I read. I finished the book in two days and I was compelled to try on grading for the upcoming fall term. I finished the book and I realized I want to do this. And more than that, it was a nagging why haven't I been doing this? Um, mixed with, uh, I didn't know that I could do this. I thought I had to use traditional grades when I was teaching. I didn't know I had an option. How naive and ignorant of me. And I was traveling to South Bend, Indiana in October uh, last year to visit family. And I noted that Susan Bloom, the editor and co-author, of, of the ungrading book teaches at the University of Notre Dame, which is in South Bend. And I figure why not ask her to have coffee and see if she would be interested in discussing ungrading. And Susan takes me up on it. And she spent 90 minutes with me and we discussed education, learning, curiosity, politics, grading, it was an opportunity for me to ask questions and further explore and ask, how did you do this? This is where I got stuck. What do you think about rubrics? Um, and this is halfway through my first ungrading term. Susan is a wonderful listener, a wise mentor, and a kind and passionate student-centered educator and human being. This in-person interaction with two people who didn't know each other but shared a common passion, provided needed inspiration for my soul. And I suddenly wanted to get Susan into as, as in front of as many colleagues as I could in hopes that they would come away with the same inspiration. In the middle of our conversation, I mentioned that my colleague, Dr. Bree Brown, wrote her dissertation on contract grading and Susan's face lit up with interest and excitement. We decided to FaceTime Brie in the middle of our coffee session, and I found joy in witnessing a beautiful moment. Our idol, Susan, enamored with Brie's work. That moment sparked many conversations, continues to provide inspiration, and led, led to Susan speaking in this series, thanks again, Michelle, and also led to Brie and I connecting with Bobby for this presentation. A link to Susan's presentation from the January On Grading for Learning and Equity session, which kicked off this equitable online teaching series, is included in our resources slide, which will be shown at the end of this presentation. The link to our slides um, 
either is or will be in the chat. And now I have the pleasure to plug Brie. Um, I've, I've done my best to set the table here and provide you with some background for how this came about. And a little later, I'm gonna share more of my experience in teaching with ungrading. Um, but for now, I'm gonna get out of the way because the two ladies that are speaking next are gonna knock your socks off. I wanna highlight Dr. Brie Brown and her work here. Her dissertation, whose title is the same of this presentation, has been shared and applauded on Twitter by some of the very same co-authors who wrote on grading. Her contributions are valuable, meaningful, and important, and I'm excited to hand this over to you, Brie. Wow. <laughs> I'm a little emotional hearing uh, that lovely introduction, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for allowing me to share my journey with equitizing my grading practices. Uh, my inspiration has been the personal connections like Dave already um, mentioned, uh, along with the research that I have done. So I am thrilled to share both with you today. Bree? Yes. Um we are seeing a gray box where perhaps you have your presenter area, which is strange because we did not see that when we tested. Okay. It's Let gone. It's, it just went away. I don't know what you did, but it just, before you stopped sharing, it went away. Let's try this again. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Sorry for interrupting you. No, well, I'm glad we didn't get to the end before someone said <laughs> something. Let's try this again. How is that? Yeah, we still see it over on the left now. I think it's the presenter view window. Yeah. That is blocking the slide. Okay, now it's gone. Now it's gone. Interesting. So if I do that. It comes back. Okay. Hmm. How about now? That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I appreciate the, uh, the feedback see it looks good we're still okay okay yep. wonderful so the first step in my journey uh, was identifying the inequities uh, that exist with our traditional grading system and so in 2017 i was uh, finding myself grading a stack of papers for one of my english courses that i taught and I realized that I was forcing my rubrics to add up to the score that I thought the students earned. <laughs> uh, and so I then realized how arbitrary uh, it was. So um, I realized that I was reading for a holistic score, but then forcing the rubric to kind of match with that. Um, so this inspired me to begin searching for new ways to grade. So I started doing a lot of reading. I read um, two of Asao Inouye's books, um, The Anti-Racist uh, uh, Writing Assessment Ecologies and his Labor-Based Contracts book. And I came across this quote here. So he reflects on his experiences uh, with traditional grading and he writes, I didn't understand the internal colonization. I didn't understand how grading by a single standard in all those classrooms of my youth were sending me one message, be white or be gone. So his statement here uh, represents the core of the problem with traditional merit grading, that historically underrepresented students are um, continuously uh, left out, and often this leads to equity gaps. So here I'll just discuss some brief takeaways from the literature that I read. Um, merit grading or traditional grading uh, for this purpose here is being defined as the traditional ABCDF scale that we have all grown up with, one that uses letter grades and corresponding percentages for individual assignments. Uh, and it was initially designed to get more students in and out of the education system efficiently um, and to be able to have an increase in class sizes. Um, so the problems with, with traditional grading include that it can invite implicit biases, um, that there are varying definitions of merit across and within disciplines. Um, and as Inouye and others have said, it is inherently racist because it relies on a white standard of discourse and a Eurocentric perspective to assess students. 
Um, and these three problems can cause disengagement and disempowerment in students. So considering the problems that I discovered with traditional grading, I began searching for ways to share power in my classroom because power was really the core of the issue that I discovered. So after doing that reading and reflecting on my own practices and biases, I decided um, to adopt a Sao Inouye's labor-based grading system, which is based on the number of incomplete, missing, and revised assignments. Um, and it's a great system, um, but for me, there was something that wasn't quite aligned uh, with my own teaching philosophy. And so that summer, I decided to enroll in probably every at one course, <laughs> including the equity and culturally responsive online teaching course, which luckily for me was facilitated by Fabiola Torres, who was inspiring in so many ways. Um, and so I, I went back to the drawing board and I started rethinking. The turning point for me was in April of 2018. I attended the three CSN Student Engagement and Success Summit at Glendale College and a history professor, Elizabeth Cronbeck, shout out to you if you're here today. Um, she was presenting her grade goal system. And uh, that system is based on the number of passing assignments in each assignment category. Um, and so as the picture indicates there, I knew that this was going to be the system for me. I was in awe of her presentation and I set out to adopt it right away. Um, and so now I'd like to share the system that I have been using. So hopefully this works. Let me know if you cannot see this. Um, I am pulling up my liquid syllabus um, grading page that I give to students. And so I'll just kind of briefly go through my system here and explain how it works. So I explain to students that the course has no points. And instead of following those points, they'll see a check mark or an X for every individual assignment. And so they look at the list of assignments for the course and complete the number listed for their desired grade goal. Uh, so it allows them to rework their assignments and really focus on improving their writing. And it also gives them more power and agency because um, they are able to decide what grade they, they think they want to strive for. Um, so I have my revision and late work policy here. I won't read it in, in full detail, but essentially students can revise any assignment throughout the semester up to two times each. And uh, they look at my feedback, my narrative feedback, and then they revise based on um, the things that I've suggested to them. Uh, for late work, shout out to Michelle Crooks, um, who allowed me to adopt her late work policy, uh, English instructor at Grossmont College and dear friend. Uh, so this is the new late work policy that she, that she gave me. Their assignment deadlines are there to keep students on track, um, but sometimes there's life obstacles. So for this reason, I accept assignments up to three days late and you just ask that students use it sparingly. But again, um, this is really in students' control, right? If they need to turn in an assignment late, they can do so, right? Uh, and so how does this all break down? I'll just um, scroll down to this part. So students will look in the chart here at um, the course letter grade, A, B, or C, and then they decide which letter grade they want to, to strive for, and they can change that throughout the semester. But when they read straight down the column, they know how many of each assignment they need to pass. So for an A, they will pass two celebrations of knowledge, which are the, the more summative assessments, two peer reviews, 13 out of 15 reading activities, which is um, like their discussion boards, their Invisible Man group project, and their Black History Month assignment. For a B, they will pass slightly fewer. You can see the numbers decrease there. And C, slightly fewer. Um, and then I've listed it here for them in case the list is a little bit more accessible. So that is essentially the, um, the system in a nutshell. I don't want to take up too much time here because I want to leave uh, plenty of room for my, my two colleagues, but I'm happy to answer more questions at the end if you have them. So coming back now to my slides. Um, once I adopted grade goals, 
um, I was so inspired um, and I had just been accepted to um, the SDSU EDD program for my doctoral studies. And I was so inspired that I decided to make uh, contract grading the topic of my dissertation as, as Dave mentioned earlier. So while I was pursuing the doctorate, um, I was collecting student feedback. I was doing some flex workshops for faculty at Cuyamaca. And every time I would present, um, rightfully so, faculty would say, show us the data, right? We want some data. And I would always have to say, um, I'm working on it, right? <laughs> the dissertation will come soon. Um, and so today I'm thrilled to be able to share that data with you. So like I mentioned, um, what really helped me shift the power in my classroom was going through the dissertation process um, and the discoveries I made in reading all the literature and um, analyzing my findings. So I'll share my research questions and findings with you today, but for our purposes, I am not covering my whole defense, um, but all the slides are available to you. And I have linked you to the full dissertation at the end of the presentation in the slides, uh, if you'd like to take a deeper dive. So <laughs> the title of my dissertation is Get the F Out of Here, Exploring Contract Grading as a Decolonizing and Equity-Minded Assessment Practice in Composition Classrooms. Um, so I just wanted to, to give you a little note about how I came up with the title. Um, it's kind of a threefold uh, title here. So um, first, uh, you know, get the F out of here, right? Um, it's a call to faculty to, to um, throw out your, or revise, question the practices that they have in place and try to imagine something new. Um, but the F also means the failing grade, right? So hopefully with adopting contract grading, we can mitigate some of those failing grades that we hand out to students. Um, and then lastly, uh, minoritized students may have heard messages like this, probably not as explicit, but messages like this um, in their educational past. And um, hopefully by revising and equitizing our practices, um, they will, um, that, that message will be revised to one of um, belonging. Okay. So first I'll go ahead and share my research questions. I had two of them. I did a mixed method study and the first one uh, is quantitative in nature. So my question was for underrepresented student populations in transfer level composition classrooms, is contract grading correlated with and predictive of these equity markers, course retention and success, course grade, concurrent and subsequent term GPAs, persistence and academic probation. So we can visualize this here. I use the input environment outcome model. And so um, the input variables were all the variables that students entered the course with. Um, and then the environments were all related to the classroom environment, which included assessment method. So there are two different assessment methods. Some students enrolled in a contract graded course and some students enrolled in a traditional merit graded course that um, traditional grading. And then the outcomes are all those equity markers, right? So um, I really, what I did was I ran correlations to examine if any of the blue inputs and environments correlated with any of the green outcomes. And then I ran regressions to determine if any of the blue variables predicted any of the green outcomes. Okay. My second research question was qualitative. So I asked, how do students enrolled in transfer level writing courses experience contract grading? And so for this, I, ran, I conducted focus groups and coded the testimony for themes. So the findings, and first I'll share some demographic information. Um, so this is the student sample disaggregated by race. Um, we had 1,687 students in the sample. 1,620 were unique, and 67 students took more than one of the flagged courses in the study. Um, so the largest group of students was Latinx students who made up 38.8% of the sample. White students made up 36.2%, and the remaining groups ranged from 3 to 6% each. And then there was about a 54% to 45% split female to male. 
Okay, so again, the sample was 1,687 students. Uh, the results, so compared to white students, contract graded Latinx, Black, and Middle Eastern students were retained at comparable rates, passed with a C or higher at comparable rates, oh, and that's it for the first one. So in, in other words, right, Latinx, Black, and Middle Eastern students did not show any equity gaps for retention or course success uh, if they took a contract graded course. So that is very exciting. The other main um, finding was compared to white students, contract graded Black and Middle Eastern students earned comparable course grades, concurrent GPAs, and subsequent term one and two GPAs. So this means one and two semesters after taking the contract graded course. So again, there were no equity gaps for course grades or concurrent subsequent term one and two GPAs for Black and Middle Eastern students if they took a contract graded course. And then the last quantitative finding here, white students passed their courses at a C or higher at comparable rates in both contract and merit graded courses. Um, so this is this is really key here. Um, so we didn't see any equity gaps, but we also didn't see um, uh, the success rates lower for white students. Qualitatively, students report that contract grading offered transparency in the course expectations and in instructor feedback. They felt safe uh, in the classroom um, because they didn't fear failure. They had an um, increased sense of confidence and they felt safe. Um, they had they were more engaged because they had an increase in motivation um, and they were part of a community and they had the option to care, which is a direct quote from my study, because they viewed revision as normal and they were more intrinsically motivated to learn. So I'll share some of the key quotes here. So for the first theme transparency with clear course expectations, um, one student initials BO said, I feel like it's a more simplistic way of looking at your grading than using points. CV said with contract grading, your grade is more in your hands and you know that ahead of time. So you can keep track of where you're at as far as your course grade and it's right there in front of you. For clear feedback, AS said whether we passed or not, we would get really good feedback. So that helped me more than some other professors. In comparison, her other instructors just gave her the letter grade, but they didn't really explain why she got that letter. For validation, uh, for not fear, fearing failure, AH wrote, uh, the other merit grading instructors were more stressful um, because I'd always be thinking, is my grammar correct? Did I get everything right? But with her uh, contract grading instructor, she felt more, more comfortable and relaxed with her assignments. And BO for confidence said, I'm just not intimidated. I whip out essays like nothing now. That's one of my favorite quotes from my study. For safe environment, AS wrote, there's something about the other system that makes me really anxious. This contract graded class and the system, I remember how I would participate a lot because I felt more free to talk and my grades weren't really defined by the percentage. It was pass or no pass, so I felt more safe that way. The third theme, engagement, JB wrote, this motivation thing, I'm loving English right now. It continued on for me. And even though we don't have the same grading, which I wish we did, I think the motivation that I came out of your classroom with really helped me in English. And AS for community wrote, uh, the contract graded class uh, made me feel like the environment was more like a family. Lastly here, option to care for normalized revision. BO wrote, I would look at your comments, but they wouldn't really make me feel bad or anything because I had the opportunity to fix it. And for intrinsic motivation, RT wrote, I learned more because I had the option to care. And that's a, another quote that really stuck with me. So the recommendations that came out of the study, um, first, I uh, recommend that faculty re-examine their grading practices and reflect on their own grading priorities. Um, the literature indicates that grading is not essential for learning, and contract grading does not mean that we're compromising rigor. Instead, we are allowing students to meet the standards through revision. 
Second, um, faculty should provide transparency and communication when implementing contract grading. Um, and it's essential to do so early in the semester and throughout the semester. High achieving students um, may take a little bit longer to adjust, um, but it's just important to reassure them uh, that they can be successful, that it is fair and um, they will be you know, just fine. Uh, it is important to note though that uh, an alternative system like this is really designed um, for underrepresented students. Faculty can foster student success um, by providing thorough and narrative feedback on work and being available in office hours or via email to help them through their revision process um, to really maximize the, the growth. Um, and then it's also important to um, have students submit surveys about the system so that you can modify it um, based on their feedback. It's important to be authentic. Uh, the system will work most effectively when faculty believe that their students are capable, capable learners and that we decentralize ourselves as the sole power keepers in the classroom um, and offer consistent positive messaging. Um, it really does, the system communicates to students that you care and prioritize growth. And then last, I recommend faculty participate in professional development, much like this one, um, centered around equity and validation, um, also working to continue to challenge our implicit biases um, and participate in PD on implementation of a system like this um, and how, how to keep moving forward. So that's it for the dissertation piece. And, and since my defense, I have been using grade goals in my own classes. Um, so I will share some lessons that I've learned and continue to make as I move forward um, to help reshape what power looks like in my classroom. So my system keeps evolving from one semester to the next based on feedback and based on the connections that I'm making with uh, other contract graders and ungraders. I listen to my students and incorporate opportunities for anonymous feedback. And I've also started building in a lot more choice into my class. So they are invited, for example, to submit their discussions in any way that's authentic to them. So a written response, creating and explaining an artwork, submitting a video or a recorded dialogue, right, um, or any other uh, medium that's authentic to them. I've also worked to build in more creative uh, assignment opportunities in my classes. Uh, and then I also have um, built in some collaboration opportunities um, where they can choose to work with a peer for one of their summative assessments, um, their celebrations of knowledge. And then within that, they have the choice to either record it as a webinar or write it up as, a, as an essay. So just some choices that I've built in to, to continue to help to give them more power. Um, and again, this is thanks to Michelle Crooks. Um, she offered this to me. I've added in grade goals check-ins, uh, one at the beginning of the term to ask students to share the grade they are hoping to earn and help them to locate the syllabus information just so they know, um, I know that they've found it. Um, so I won't read this here, but this image is in the slides and you're happy to use it if you'd like to. I also do a mid-semester check-in just to see um, how they're progressing towards their goal, if they have any questions for me, um, how many more of each assignments they need to pass to get to where they want to be. And again, you're welcome to use this if you'd like to. Um, it is in the slides. Um, here, I just like to offer something I discovered actually just a couple weeks ago. So you can see the process continues to evolve. Um, I've been trying to figure out how best to communicate this leveraging the Canvas features. Um, so what I decided to do was create assignment categories for each of my grade goals. So most of the assignments will go into the C grade goal. And then all I did was I, I put in the couple additional assignments that are required for the B and the couple more additional required for the A. Um, and these are all collapsed, so you can't see all my assignments in there. Um, but I just wanted to show you my assignment categories. And then for students, oh, sorry. 
for students, this is what they will see. And really what I'm trying to just emphasize here is under each assignment title in Canvas, you can see um, required for C grade goal, required for B grade goal, et cetera. And then you can kind of start to see the checks and X's that they'll see for, for their grades. And so I will be collecting feedback on the assignment categories and, and see how students uh, liked it uh, and work to continue to evolve the system next semester. So in fall 2020, uh, this was really a turning point for me in terms of personal connections. Um, as Dave already mentioned, I connected with him when I became his DE counterpart at Cuyamaca College. He works at, at our sister college at Grossmont. And um, after that FaceTime call with Susan Bloom, I was, <laughs> it was a real fangirl moment for me, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but Susan was gracious enough to share my dissertation on Twitter and she tagged Asao Inouye, <laughs> one of my other heroes in this space. And now he and I have connected on Twitter. And so uh, it's really just amazing uh, the community that's out there. Uh, the Twitter space is very, very active with ungrading uh, folks. Um, and I was also able to connect with Suzanne Joachim uh, to design the new equitable grading strategies course. And of course, Fabiola Torres on the article we just wrote in preparation for this webinar today. So um, my heart is full um, with these personal connections. Uh, and uh, I have found my community, which has been uh, one of the most positive uh, takeaways for me. So to conclude my section of our presentation, uh, I just want to um, say where I am right now. Uh, I'm at a place of calm as an instructor. I enjoy reading my student work because I'm not focused on the grades or on being punitive. Um, my students are happier, they're less stressed, and they're fearless. And they take risks in their writing and feel secure um, that I will uh, validate them. And I've been able to create more meaningful relationships with my students. Um, so moving to this grading system has reminded me of why I went into teaching in the first place. Uh, and I'm never going back. And if anything, I may be the next ungrader <laughs> um, because of the inspiration I've, I've had from my colleagues. So with that, I am so happy to uh, pass the baton to our wonderful Fabiola Torres, who um, will continue to spark and engage you all. Thank you very much. Uh, so we can see this okay? I can just have, I don't see my, okay, there we go. Okay, everyone. Um, just because someone already texted me, why am I wearing a Valley College shirt? This is my alumni, okay? I am an alumnus of LA Valley College. Go Monarchs. Um, I could have worn Cal State Northridge or Pepperdine, but I am a proud Monarch from LA Valley College. I found my voice, I found my purpose at um, Valley College. So much love to Valley College colleagues that are out there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin. First things first, I'm sure we're all interested in seeing the results of our word cloud, especially after uh, the presentation, the fabulous Dr. Brie Brown uh, provided for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this and see the results. Um, it does come out pretty light. So for those of us who don't have the capacity to see this clearly, hopefully when you go back to the slides, you can get it at a better screen. I don't know if you're on your phone or your iPad or, or just listening, but the three words that pop out the most of what we think grades are measuring, it's performance, compliance, and understanding. And then there's other ones that come out in the word cloud like following directions, student learning, memorization, mastery, learning, effort, privilege. So we can see already how we think learning, uh, what we think uh, grades measure. So I wanted to share that with all of us. Um, but I want us to take a moment to, take, to breathe. I seriously, everyone, just take a deep breath in. And now, 
And I'm, I added this because, you know, when I was working with Dr. Bree Brown and just meeting her, and I'll talk about fangirling, I was at a ungrading discord unconference and hundreds of people in this unconference. And I bump into uh, Dr. Brown in that unconference. So I didn't even know who she was. I didn't even, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know who she, where she was from. I just saw this person who posted, get the F out of here. And I'm like, who are you? And then putting two and two together, we realize that we have interacted in the past. So uh, to work with her and to collaborate with her and reading her dissertation, you know, it, what she presents to us, it really shakes us to our core. And for those of us who answered no into like equitable grading or you don't know, um, this is, it's, it's really hard to shed a lot of that academic culture that is still embedded in our DNA. So I wanna uh, call out to our academic ancestor that um, many of us hold dear to our heart and that is Audre Lorde. And I wanna quote her, she says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that's an act of political warfare. I'm sharing that because as Brie ended about how she feels as, as an instructor, as a teacher and her learning environment now gives her that sense of joy and, and, and relaxation, I agree with her. It is absolutely true. So on December 19th, 2020, Bell Hooks passed away. And to honor her, I reread the book, Teaching to Transgress. And it really reminded me what transgress means. So I wanted to be that teacher that breaks the rules. So I went to the ungrading section. I went to that ungrading method. Um, I went all the way. I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to transgress. So um, this is the process that I went through. I wanted to see the inequities of my teaching, of my learning environment. So my equity-minded work begins when I grapple with curriculum. What am I teaching? When I grapple with pedagogy, how am I teaching? When I grapple with assessment, how I test. And when I grapple with issues of our control and power, who holds the power in our learning environment? So I wanted to share that power. So I'm gonna show you a series of images. I'm a doodler, but I'm a doodler in Notability, which is an app on, on um, a mobile device. And so I doodle. And so um, those pictures are gonna share, are gonna reflect how I wanted to turn rigor into a more relevant experience. Okay, so I wanted to turn rigor into more relevant, make it more relevant, make our learning environment more meaningful. So I was watching a presentation by Dr. Christopher Emden. He wrote an amazing book called Ratchetdemic. And he inspired me with the concept voice and choice. So I believed voice and choice was a great way of thinking about how I can design my course with ungrading at the core of its center, but really about making the course content, the course, ex the learning experience relevant and meaningful. So I drew this. So this is how I go through my process. I just doodle. I don't go into Canvas and start designing. I just doodle. So I know it's it's small. So for those of us who can't see this clearly, let me just kind of explain to you what is here. It, it, it's a map, okay? It's like a like a Google, uh, you know, directions, and it starts with orientation and all the elements that are needed in orientation, the units, 
units one, two, three, I have three units, and then a final assessment. I do wanna give a shout out to Helen Graves. Helen Graves gave a great workshop on um, universal design. And uh, she talked about rhythm. She talked about how we can set modules into a, into a rhythm, um, create assessments, you know, in, with a rhythm. Now that doesn't mean we're all dancing to the same rhythm, but we, but that predictability of what students know, what's to expect, can ease the the stress. So we see here we have unit one, we have learning content, a discussion, more learning content, and then here's the choice. I wanted to give assessment choices. What would be the best way to address the essential question? So I use essential questions in my ethnic studies course. So as they go through the content and the discussion and the additional resources, they think about what is the best way for them to express their knowledge? What is the best way for them to express that they are learning? And what's the, what is their best way of addressing the essential questions? So they can choose to create, collaborate, or curate. Same thing goes for unit two and the rhythm goes, same process goes all the way to the end. Now I did notice in the chat earlier that a lot of folks are still asking the question, if you're ungrading, how do you give a grade? Yes, I still have to give a grade. And I go for the student self-evaluation. That is their final assessment. Now, before we start to think, well, everyone's gonna give themselves an A. I hope so. But let me explain how the self-evaluation is used. Students have to show evidence. So they're the ones writing a narrative. They show evidence of competency, excellence, growth, and risk-taking. And then it gets, you can see how I'm peppered in throughout the course, like this is where I'm gonna be with, you know, with them. Now, again, this is just a drawing board, everyone. I'm just drawing. So then, Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Okay, so then I realized there was a piece missing in my drawing, in my plan. And this was definitely, you know, the feedback. How am I going to deal with the feedback? So students either meet the criteria or they get a redo. Okay, and what's a redo? Well, they reflect, they edit, they discover, and they observe. And so I was sharing this with my brother. Now you can see he is a much better doodler than I am. <laughs> At a restaurant, just us having a meal, hanging out, he quickly draws this up because he is fascinated with the redo process. When we reflect, you know, uh, what works, you know, a student has to think, well, what's working, what's not, what adjustments do I have to make? What are the next steps? Next is the edit. So they're allowed to make mistakes, but they could adjust and they could you know, edit their work. They could erase or they can make. Uh, they discover, you know, they find a new pathway. They find opportunities to progress forward. And then of course they observe, okay? And they observe that, you know, what has to be done for let's say future. That's why we have here the, the, you know, they're looking out, like, how is this going to help them in their future assessment and in their future experience? Now, I know a lot of us are like, well, show us details, show us details. I get it. So I'm going to be very generous to just open the doors to my syllabus. So if you're wondering for more details, the web page is available for you to click. And so this is my liquid syllabus section on ungrading in ethnic studies. I'm going to share this one minute video with you to kind of give you an abridged version of how the class then was finalized. And of course, I should mention that this was launched for winter 2022. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. No grades, no points, three units. Each unit will have course content to read a class discussion, and more content to engage in. At the end of the unit, 
there's a choice of assessments. Choices include to create or collaborate or curate a project focused on the unit content. Guidance will be provided. Students receive a complete or a redo. With the help of the teacher, students redo until they earn a completion. In the end, students self-evaluate themselves, advocating for their grade by providing evidence in growth, competency, excellence, and risk-taking. Okay, so that was an example. Get out of here. Okay, here we go. Give me one second. All right, let's get back here. So this is available for you, um, but this is what my students see, okay? Now, if you want to see an example of uh, final student self-assessments, I've actually included how I self-evaluate. What are the definitions of competency, excellence, growth, and risk-taking? And then examples of their narratives. Now, what's interesting is that students are actually harder on themselves. And some of them will actually say, I deserve a B. And then they'll say, you know, I didn't think I took enough risks. And they have the evidence. So they bring in the evidence. In unit one, I did a curate. In unit two, I did a curate. In unit three, I could, I should have done a creative, but I still stayed with what I was comfortable. So I don't think I took a risk. And so then when they self-assess, then the opportunity for me to talk to them, you know, opens up. And, you know, I'll say, okay, so what, what do you think, uh, you know, has to happen to, in another class that you feel that will, you know, show that you are taking a risk? And so we have these conversations, and most of the time, they're harder on themselves. And I'm saying, you've done all the work. You've met all the criteria. You're being really hard on yourself. I want to celebrate your accomplishment. And they end up earning a higher grade. Because I teach ethnic studies, Many students um, don't need ethnic studies as their major uh, for, for their major, but they need it for area F. So they choose to do a pass, no pass. And so we actually have a section on how you can do it if you just want to pass the class and achieve a um, achieve a, a, a pass for the class. And again, I have here um, the syllabus that you are more than welcome to show. I mean, to access, I do have two videos here um, that I wanna respect the time that we have. Please, I encourage you to go and visit them so you can see um, how um, I prepare students for this new paradigm. Because we can't just shift the goalpost on our students. We have to really enable trust. And this is where the humanizing online education just becomes heightened. The trust that students need from us that for them to feel that we have their backs because they're so used to going for the grade. Um, there's a lot of unlearning that happens in the first week or two. So it is extremely important for us to be that human. Um, just to show you might as well for a little bit. Um, I hate grades. You know, I'm just there talking if to I them. If I grades out of learning, we would all have a better experience. So I want to leave grades out of this class. But if we are going to leave grades and points out of this class, we need to establish trust between us. So I go ahead and talk about how the trust is extremely important between one another. I wanted to share this because what I've discovered is that the redo process has become so enlightening in this ungrading process. So they have, again, they have work to do. They have discussions and assessments, discussions, and these, they all constantly change. I should mention that I teach an eight-week accelerated class, so it moves fast. Again, this is in small text, and I sure, I'm sure some of us don't have the capacity to see this, but I'm just going to read three sentences so you can see and hear what this student is uh, reflecting, editing, discovering, and um, observing. Okay, so this is what they turn in when they're, you know, when they get a redo. Okay, let's redo 
So they turn in the assignment and then they turn in this reflection. And it says here, the comments you left were very insightful and have deepened my understanding tremendously. The idea of how the lecture and posts inspires me to add to my overall answer comes from my omission of certain additions of certain omissions of examples of how the unit language is seen represented within the unit. One example would be how within Gabriel's post, I found that I was missing a key example for the, con the continuation of deception and betrayal within the idea of how the local government deceived the Chicano people by saying they were gonna build housing, but instead built base a baseball stadium. You can see already, he's already telling me what he's, uh, what he's omitted. And he goes further and he's deconstructing his work. He's telling me, I'll tell you this, by the end of reading this, I feel like I didn't even have to read his, his resubmission because I could already tell and he has evidence of what he's done. So when he does that end of the semester self-evaluation, he has evidence that, yeah, I grew because this is what I did and this is how I revised. Look at this last sentence. Of all these additions, I believe I will lead a better answer. Um, it would lead to a better answer to the essential question and allow me for a more well-rounded argument. Okay, so he already is observing in the future how he's gonna um, you know, do a better job. So now when I shift the power, These are two things that I'm really still, when I shift the power, these are the two things that I constantly have to keep in mind. Trust and risk-taking from myself. And these two quotes are something that are very, that really inspired me. One of them is from Dr. Laura Gibbs. She, she said in a presentation and she was quoted, I started ungrading for me so that I could actually be a better teacher instead of a judge or worse, a cop. And risk-taking, this is from the chapter ungrading, one of my favorite chapters, math teacher, Gary Chu, who said, funny how we expect students to take risks, but teachers are afraid to take risks. That really got me uh, because it's, it's, it's scary. You know, it is scary, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So I'm going to reshape that power constantly. So I'm doing my own redo process. How am I reflecting? How am I editing? How am I just, what am I discovering and what am I observing? So I really am re realizing that all of this is about teaching and it really is about our teaching. It's a constant checking in in our process, in my process and in my practice. Susan Bloom said one of my favorite quotes, she said, find your buddy and champion on. And if you're not on Twitter, um, just go there as a participant, um, but Twitter, the ungrading community is amazing. It really is amazing because it helps you. You can say, hi, I'm an econ, I'm an econ teacher. I'm new to ungrading. Anybody's out there, <laughs> hashtag ungrading, and you will get a response. We're not in this alone. We're in this together. And we all are at different places in our profession. And we're all at different places, um, even in our own, you know, environment. Um, but I want to concur with what uh, Bree said, uh, Dr. Brown said, which is about bringing that, just bringing the joy back to what we do. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Dave. Thank you, Fabi. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm a co-presenter, but I'm in awe of my, of my colleagues. I just, I'm really blown away by their work and, um, and the presentation. <clears throat> okay, and, and I'm going to try to drive us home um, and then have some time for, for Q&A. Um, before I get into to a little bit on inequities, I, I want to share. I was I was working late uh, a couple nights ago. I was pre prepping for this presentation. I was thinking about a slide and what I wanted to share, and kind of staring off into space. And my ten year old daughter said, "Daddy, you look stressed." 
are you all right? <laughs> and I said, yes, um, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm preparing for this presentation and I think there might be a large audience and it's really important to me and I wanna provide value and I really wanna get it right. And um, in that moment, I think that's what we all want. We all want to get it right. We wanna get it right for our students. And so I, I'm, I'm watching the chat and I'm really appreciating the respectfulness of the chat, the questions that are asked. And I think a lot of people are in a lot of different places and a lot of people teach a lot of different things. Um, and and I, I understand that, but um, you know, thanks for your, your engagement in the chat. Um, one thing I wanna add on, on inequities, um, and I, I linked to this, um, where some of this came from. Uh, as we've seen, there are inequities with traditional grading, and I'm gonna to touch on one more here. If, if I were to pull this group, or really any, any group of instructors at the college level and ask, what's your participation policy? How much is your midterm worth? Or if you have a midterm, or if you accept late work, if you allow redos, uh, if you offer extra credit, I have 100% certainty that there would be variance. And I strongly believe in academic freedom. Um, but the arbitrary nature, and I think Marianne made this point in the chat um, a while back, the arbitrary nature of these policies has a predictable effect. Two students with identical performances in a course could earn different grades from different teachers, even when the teachers use identical curriculum and their students perform similarly on exams. Teachers grade differently and often include non-academic criteria that can be infused with biases. When that happens, grades become so confusing and variable that it weakens meaning and validity. Does a student's B reflect strong content knowledge but late assignments? Or does the B represent a student's weak content, content knowledge but admirable effort? If a student in one teacher's class earns a B, what confidence is there that the B in that class has the same meaning as a B in another class? And if grades don't have consistent meaning, what are the implications? How does this affect success, retention, degrees earned, program acceptance? transfer eligibility. Um, you may recall I shared that I read the ungrading book last summer and I was inspired and committed to trying ungrading in some form in the fall. I was also embarrassed because I had not realized that I had a choice of alternative grading. I felt naive. Uh, additionally, I'm a graduate of UC Santa Cruz. Um, as I saw, there were some fellow banana slugs in the in the group here. And I attended there at a time when they used a no, a pass, no pass grading system with narrative evaluations. Um, that was one of many reasons why I chose to, to attend. And I really liked that as a student, um, because I felt it fostered a more supportive and collaborative learning environment rather than a competitive and a cutthroat one. Um, but as an instructor, I felt like I should have known better as though I should have started ungrading a long time ago. Um, better now than, than better, better late, you know, than, than never. Um, when I finished reading on grading and committed myself, I had two weeks to get my course ready. I'm the type of person that likes to be organized, planned and advanced. I like my course to be designed from start to finish before it begins. And that was not going to be possible in this case, but I thought it was important enough to try. So I took the leap. Um, this is what it felt like. And it was uncomfortable. Uh, but I had support around me. And so I want to reiterate one of one of Fabi's points. This does not need to be solo. Um, you know, if this is something you want to do or try, find your people, find your support, find your encouragement, find colleagues who will help you when you get stuck, when you have questions, when you're looking for answers. Um, utilize Twitter. Uh, I, I don't often recommend social media, but you know we we found some some gold um, in some of the um, resources on Twitter. Um, and then I teach college success classes, and and you know I I 
and very sensitive to does this apply to this discipline? Does this apply to this uh, area? I, I, I get that. And I'll speak a little bit more about that um, in a bit, but I wanna share a few things um, about my experience. So I, I, I'm in my infancy here. I, I've tried this one time uh, for one class in one term. And, and I fell on my face you know, a bunch of times and learned a lot and, and am, am growing. Um, so one goal I had was to eliminate points. And, um, and I found that mostly I was very successful in doing that. It was somewhat like an onion. Um, you know, you, you try to take away some things here and then, and then there's a domino effect um, and, and you have to, to modify some other places. Um, for assignments, I went completely on a complete incomplete basis. And, um, and I was pleased with that. There's still a fair amount of tinkering that I want to do. Um, but a lot of this was, was aligned with um, both with what, what Bree and Fabi um, presented on. Um, I had a, albeit somewhat arbitrary, uh, measure of satisfaction. Um, you know, is what, what deems it to be complete? Here's the submission. Is it, you know, a certain standard? Uh, I realize that that is still arbitrary. Um, I'm, I'm working on improving some of that. Um, and then I had, to, I had to edit my syllabus because I had to present this to students. I had to say, you know, here's, here's what we're doing. And, um, and so an excerpt from my syllabus was, is, um, Assignments will be graded as complete or incomplete. Incomplete assignments may be resubmitted for regrading. This course has a grading system based on a letter grade, A through F. Still haven't gotten away from that. Um, two meetings with your instructor at the midpoint and at the end of the term will be scheduled to discuss and determine your grade. And and so I wanted to present that as collaborative in the vein of sharing power. Um, and, and I was not super comfortable with that, but, um, but I, I enjoyed it. And I, and I think the students, um, I think it resonated with the students and it's, you know, it's different. It's, it's, a, it's often a culture shock. Um, so I was introducing this on the first day of class. We're going to try something new. I've never done this before. It's called ungrading. Your goal is to learn. And we're not going to allow points or grades to get in the way. Uh, for the one-on-one -on -one meetings, <laughs> I was nervous. Um, but they, you know, they were great. Uh, when I asked each student, what do you think your grade should be? There was not one instance where a student suggested a grade that was further than one letter grade away from where I had them. Um, and more often than not, and, and um, this was spoken about previously as well, their suggested grade was lower um, than where I had them. Um, and so here's a screenshot of, um, I, I saw a lot of things about Canvas uh, in the chat and, and <laughs> I'll address a, a couple of things here. So. I was pleased with how this looks because there's no points here. Um, I was successful in eliminating points with one exception, quizzes. I wanted to retain quizzes and have them count for completion, but not points. Um, and I wanted students to know how they did. I wanted them to be able to see the questions that they missed. But I couldn't figure out a way to do that. And, and that led to some frustration with Canvas limitations and with options for quizzes. And I think that's consistent with a lot of things I saw in the chat. Now, since then, I've been introduced to the Learning Mastery Gradebook, which is um, potentially a not super well-known alternative in Canvas um, that I didn't know about. Uh, so if you're interested in this and you're, in, you're not already privy to it, ask your DE coordinator or your instructional designer. Um, this grade book is better suited for ungrading um, and contract grading, and I plan on using it in the future. It's not perfect, um, but I think it, it matches better for what, for what I'm trying to do. Um, and and um, I neither want to say that Canvas is doing great, nor, 
nor really criticize Canvas. What I will say is that Canvas is listening and Canvas is making changes, including some upcoming updates um, in the regular Canvas gradebook um, with outcomes that we're excited about. Um, and I think that's, uh, so in the chat, you have a, a link to a guide if you're interested in exploring the Learning Mastery Gradebook. And then um, I wanna share this reflection from a student because I think it's important to hear the student voice. So this is a student that was in my class sharing um, feedback after the class had ended about the experience with ungrading. Hi there, my name is Shiloh and this has been my experience with ungrading. We often equivalent good grades with success and that by obtaining good grades that the student has learned all that they needed. In my personal experience, I have noticed quite the opposite. I have learned material and failed courses. I have passed classes without retaining any of the content critical to the course. Um, and what I appreciate about the method of ungrading is that it puts focus on learning, not just memorizing parts of information in order to pass. It's about understanding the concept in its entirety in order to learn and expand knowledge. I was lucky enough to be introduced to ungrading once before. Starting this class and being reintroduced, I remembered my previous experience and felt comfortable and confident to take on the course. My biggest takeaway was the, for me was the alleviation of stress caused by test anxiety. Due to having no time limit and an open book option for quizzes, this not only helped me focus more on the test questions, but it actually aided me in my reading as well. It made me feel confident and prepared for each class discussion, and this gave me the ability to read through each question as often as I needed to, um, to understand the intent or purpose of each question and answer based off of knowledge retained, rather than rush guesswork to, march, to mark each question in hopes of completion for a grade. Most re this most recent experience with ungrading has been more empowering as well as motivating for me to learn more. Coming from a former <laughs> student with poor grades and a 10 year hiatus from school, I was not only able to complete my first semester of college, but, I, but by applying what I learned in this course to my others, for the first time ever, I not only gained new knowledge but it, to help me be successful, but I also achieved straight A's. And this has been my experience with ungrading. Hi there, my name is Shiloh. And okay, I am I am aware of the time, and I'm going to wrap up quickly so that we'll have just a little bit for for Q and A. Um, I just have a couple more things. Um, there's not one size fits all. This this can be done in many different ways. Um, and, and we, you know, if you're if you're interested in trying this, or if you're already doing this, um, there's a lot of different ways to to do it. Okay, and this is a plea of mine. So I, I don't usually try to get people to do things. I'm not a salesperson. I'm not real comfortable asking folks to do things. People who know me would describe me as calm and respectful, um, risk averse, and conflict averse, and Ordinarily, when I'm presenting on things I'm, I'm doing, I offer it as here's what I'm doing, here's where I see the value, take it or leave it. With this, I'm just I'm more compelled um, to go further, to encourage you, to try to inspire you, to ask you to try it. Um, and, and with that, I want to share a little bit about my privilege. I am white, male, able-bodied, cisgender, straight. I'm a full-time faculty member. I have a lot of privilege. And it's easier for me to take risks and try new things than it is for others. And I recognize that. And I also recognize that traditional grading was designed for people like me to succeed. And I recognize that ungrading is more equitable and better for all. Um, we hear the pushback, we hear the resistance. We get that it's not easy for this discipline, that STEM has more challenges, that what about state licensure? Um, qualifications, what about med school, what about nursing? Um, you know, we, we hear all that. We understand those questions and they're good questions. Um, 
And we understand it takes time and energy to do this. And who could take on another thing right now? And, and part-time faculty can't have more unpaid asks of their time. We, we hear all that. We feel you. We're not disputing that there are challenges. And we still want to encourage you to try it. Maintaining the status quo can be comfortable, easy, and familiar. If you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting. If status quo is harmful for students, then shouldn't there be change? Shouldn't we be initiating change? Shouldn't we be knocking down doors for change? And I'll end here. Uh, I saw this slide from another presentation. I thought it was a great fit. And I reached out to Dr. Curry, president of Compton College, an equity avenger, and he granted permission to use it. Um, and, and I think it's powerful. I am in the infancy of ungrading, and there are many things I want to change and try to do. No matter how that develops, I'm not going back to traditional grading. I am unapologetic about not going back to traditional grading. A little louder, as they say, for the people in the back. We are unapologetic in initiating more equitable grading, giving students greater agency and reshaping power. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, if we have a couple of minutes for Q&A, this is the conclusion of our, of our presentation. Now that I'm crying. <laughs> wow, that was, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, on behalf of everyone here today who's been so engaged in the chat, um, including myself, thank you for that. Thank you for giving so much um, the past hour and a half. And um, so there's one question that's at the top and it's actually quite different from any other questions. So I'm gonna honor that one and ask it right now. It's about using portfolios, e-portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, using an e-portfolio based grading system, I wanna do it and I'm hoping for some suggestions. So is there, do you have any input on that question? Like even a tool to use, like anything. The first tool I'll say is Twitter. Uh, there are faculty out there using portfolios, and that discussion is being held all the time. Um, I don't have a solution to that. Um, so the tool that comes up to me is Twitter reaching out for help via Twitter. Dave or Brian, anything to add? Uh, I, so that is something I'm very interested in. I would like to experiment with portfolios and, and I haven't jumped into that yet. So I'm going to take up Fabi on her suggestion and use Twitter. Um, Susan Bloom uses portfolios and, um, and, and you may wanna check out some of the resources that are in one of our last slides that is the same slide as the article that, that Bri and Fabi wrote. Um, because there will be some things in there that will lead to uh, support for portfolios. Yeah, I'm seeing in the chat, um, Jamie put in that 3CSN has a great e-portfolio workshop that they teach. The only thing I really know is there is a Canvas tool called e-portfolios, e but um, I haven't uh, explored that personally. But yeah, I just right. echo, um, find your, find your e-portfolio uh, colleagues. And I see Jeannie Costello says that they're piloting portfolio at Fullerton College. Um, I've seen faculty use Google Sites to, or even leave the tool completely agnostic and leave it to students and give one tool as an option. So you could say you could use something like Google Sites, which is free, but requires a Google account or any other tool. This is what your goal is, is to curate these, you know, X number, all your criteria and just kind of define it that way and leave the tool open to students. But um, good conversation. I think that's a that's a great topic to dig, dig deeper on. We had a lot of questions around Canvas, which Dave, I think you you got to a little bit there about someone wanted to see what your grade book looked like. So I think that that was really helpful to see that. Um, and then we also had some questions about I mean, they, this word wasn't used, but I'm going to use it like backlash. 
Um, and Dave, you touched upon that at the end too. Do, do any of you have anything else to add about like um, your, your just advice to give when you start getting pushback and whether that pushback be from your students or that pushback be from your peers? Um, Dave, I found what you said very inspirational, uh, but sometimes in the, in the heat of the moment, like just some language, some positioning can be, some tips might be helpful for, for, helpful for some folks. I can speak a little bit to this. Um, I, I'll first just make a, a quick statement about the Canvas and shamelessly plug our Equitable Grading Strategies course one more time. We have tons of Canvas connection pages that will walk you through step-by-step -step on how to implement one of these systems using Canvas. So tons and tons of resources and we go at a, a slower pace and a full deep dive there. Um, as far as pushback, um, for me, when I first started doing contract grading, I actually reached out to my dean to let her know. Um, and uh, I, I followed up with her about a year, year and a half later. And she said, um, I have never received a grade complaint from any contract graded course of yours. So I, I, that's what I can speak to there. It's, it seems anecdotally that students um, complain less, <laughs> make formal complaints less. Um, so that was, that was one thing that um, I wanted to say. The backlash or the pushback I typically get from students is more from traditionally high achieving students. And Dave mentioned this, um, usually are from the dominant group or who, who enter these spaces with privilege. And really it's just about reassuring them that they will be successful in your course. Um, these students will succeed with any system and we're designing new systems to honor and validate historically underrepresented students. And that's the purpose of the work. Um, so I just wanted to speak to the student side, but um, I can let someone else jump in. Well said, Bree. Um, I, think, I think both Dr. Bree Brown, Dave and myself, we're unapologetic, but we are also privileged being full-time tenured um, so we recognize that. Um, however, I will add that a great way to, you know, respond is um, I like some of you were, were sharing, you know, nerding out when Brie was sharing her information. Um, I like to nerd out with my colleagues. I like to say what pedagogical theorists frame your grading policies. I'd love to hear that. I can tell you which ones mine do. So um, I think when I shifted, like, okay, well, let's talk about these pedagogical frameworks and how are they in influencing your grading policies? And that's where the conversation begins. So um, for the student, it's really, like I said in the, in the presentation, establishing trust and unlearning the, the learning that they have um, accumulated in years of oppressive practices opposed upon their learning experience. I don't have much to add to that, but but I will say that um, I'm seeing some organic um, organization and communication, professional development, and future discussions happening in the chat. That's exactly what we were hoping for, um, you know. And and I'm gonna say that I would be happy and somewhat volunteer, Bobby and Bree. We we would be happy to go through the Q and A. Um, and, and do a deeper dive. And if we pull some things from there that, that we think are gonna be helpful, we can share those back out. That would be great. Well, I'll be sure to, to provide you with that transcript. Thank you for that offer. Um, this has been amazing. And I know that everybody has just feels full and empowered and unapologetic at this point, so. Thank you so much for being here and for contributing and for anchoring everything in data. And when I say data, I mean your stories too, because stories are data. They're just not always valued the same as the quantitative data. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I was very moved by, by the grounding and the stories and the power of community.
Okay, everybody, we're going to sign off. Thank you again and have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you.